Buzu, and in Tanya Talaga and Nagisnikas. My name is Tanya. I'm, um, I'm thrilled to be here on the unceded territory of my Algonquin brothers and sisters. It always feels good to be in Ottawa. Um, yes, I just said that. <laughs> Even when it's really cold and really icy, um, I always do enjoy being here. And um, I have to say um, thank you so much for that, uh, that warm welcome, Francine. Yes, we have lots in common, that big number 20. Um, and also, too, you never really get, um, get over the fright of standing in front of so many people looking at you, you know? Like you said, you do most of your work behind the camera, and you did for the longest time. I am a print journalist, and there was a reason why I was a print journalist. <laughs> I never thought I would be doing something like this um, and doing it and doing it and doing it. I want to acknowledge um, the elders that are here. I want to acknowledge, oh, hey, hi, I see you. <laughs> um, yes, I'm, I am just like Claudette. I'm going to like see people in the audience and start waving. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, it's, it always feels good to see uh, folks that I know here. Um, I would also like to very much acknowledge, um, I think I just said the elders, but I also want to acknowledge my friend Natan Obed, leader of the ITK, who is here. I asked him to come, and he made the time. Kitchi Mikwich, thank you so much for coming, Natan. I know you hate this. I'm singling you out. I'm sorry. Um, but I'm honored that you're here to, uh, to listen to me today. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to tell you, mostly I'm going to talk about, about Seven Fallen Feathers and how that book came about. And doing so, I'm going to also tell you about a little bit about myself, too, and how I got there. Um, how I told the story, because I'm very also aware of the fact that I'm giving a lecture in front of lots of journalists, lots of communicators, and oh, hey, Brett, yes. <laughs> um, lots of lots of people that um, that love the craft, that know the craft. And when Susan Harada, you know, called me up and she asked me, she goes, "Will you come and will you give Kester some lecture? Um, we'd like you to speak on indigeneity." I thought, okay, that's interesting. What does that word mean? What does that word mean in context of journalism and in context of the stories that I tell and how I tell those stories? And is it so different from everyone else? Is what we do so different? Yes and no. And by me telling you the story today of Seven Fallen Feathers, I'm going to sort of talk about, about that very much so, about how we tell stories and how we hope you see our stories and how you see, though, that we're all people, after all, at the end of the day. Um, I'm going to also tell you, as I said, a little bit about myself. You heard a bit earlier, I've been a journalist for 20 years. If you've heard me talk before, you know I have a joke here. I started when I was 12. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Else. Yes. Oh, thanks. Robust laughter. Yeah. Um, but it's it's important to you know that question be uh, a, a little bit about me about how long I've been at the Toronto Star. I've actually been there my entire career. I started as an intern when we had uh, paid interns at the Star, and I really never left because you see I was kind of the um, I was kind of the odd person out. I didn't go to journalism school. Um, I know, yes, uh, yes, shocking, I'm sorry. Don't run screaming from the building yet. Um, I was sort of one of the last ones that they let in before that sort of all came down. But I had spent time at, uh, I went to university, I went to the University of Toronto, and I was um, constantly involved with my uh, campus um, press, the Strand, and then the Varsity. Sort of taught me a little bit about journalism. And through there, I got hired as an intern at the Star. And I spent time there doing everything you do when you start in a newsroom. You know, you do things like you start, co you cover crime, you work in the box, which some of you, hello, Alan, you'll remember the box. Um, yeah, I was 12 when I was in the box too. 
you're, you sit there, I'll just say um, briefly, you sit there and for 24 hours, you work on a 24 hour cycle. So you work overnights and you listen to the ambulance scanners, the police scanners, um, and you listen for the codes. Uh, so you know what's going on and then you call there's a man um, or a person it was usually a man though um, called a night stalker that was out driving his car around with his phone and his cameras and he would call Henry Stanku um, in the middle of the night and say I've heard of something happening live and it's over here will you go there and take pictures and that is essentially your job and uh, but you have to stay awake and you have to know these things um, so when you start at the star when you start in any print newsroom you do everything you get thrown in you have to learn everything from the beginning it's a sink or swim newsroom very much so Hi, <laughs> um, as you all very well know and it was in um, I did a variety of jobs and it was in about 2011 when we had another federal election well underway um, that I pitched a story because I had just started as a provincial affairs reporter um, I was at Queen's Park. I was working with uh, Robert Benzie and Robert Ferguson, two of the best political journalists around who taught me so much, especially how to yell at politicians. Um, questions, of course. And I was there and I was working and I really wanted to get in on the federal election. Because when you're a journalist and you're a political journalist and there's a federal election going on, you want to be a part of that mix. But the only thing was is I didn't have any experience covering federal politics. I covered provincial. And so I had to come up essentially with my own story ideas. And they had to be pretty good story ideas if the national editor was going to let me go on to be a part of the election pool. And so I had to come up with an idea. And so I did. I wanted to do a story, and I pitched this to my national editor at the time. I asked her, I said, you know, I would like to do a story on why it is Indigenous people don't vote historically in elections. Keep in mind, this is 2011. Keep in mind, this is before Idle No More. This is before the proliferation of social media, before Twitter, before everything that you see on your phones, and we're all attached to our phones right now. This was before APTN was all over the place too. This is before CBC Indigenous was all over the place and in our conscience and shaping how we do news stories. It was a very different time. But I pitched that story because I, I was being a bit sneaky with it too, I gotta say. I knew that if you're a status Indian in this country, you did not receive the right to vote until 1960. But when I asked my editor, you know, I'd like to do this story, she said, what an exotic idea. Why don't you go tell that story? Go do it. And so I did. And I pitched as well that I needed to go to Thunder Bay to tell this story. And there's a, there is a reason why I needed to go there. Um, my father, Polish from Winnipeg. My mom is Anishinaabe. She is from the traditional lands of Fort William First Nation, a little place called Wraith, Ontario, which is honestly, um, it is in the bush. There's no other way to describe it. Um, Wraith and Graham, she grew up in both places. And you, um, as you go along the highway out to the Manitoba border, about an hour outside of Thunder Bay, you'll run into these little tiny places. And that's where she grew up. And I knew that if I wanted to tell the story well, I needed to go up to my mom's community. And I also needed to go there because there was someone I really wanted to go see. And that person, his name was Stan Berity. Stan Berity, um, at the time, was the Grand Chief of Nishnabi Aski Nation. I should tell you, too, that I do speak in circles. But I always have a point. So you just have to sort of stay with me. Um, and this will all become clear because I, I truly am talking about journalism here. This is kind of, this is behind the story and how we got to, well, how we got to this book. So I went to speak to Stan and Stan at the time was Grand Chief of Anishinaabe Aski Nation. And I have this map here for you so you can see if you're not familiar with Nan, um, Nan is Treaty Number no. 9 territory. It covers about two-thirds of the province of Ontario. And all of those little dots that you see are communities in Anishinaabe Aski Nation. There are 49 of them. About 45,000 people live in all of those little communities. Most of them are remote, um, accessible by, uh, by plane, charter plane, or by uh, winter roads. And the communities 
they don't have a lot of things that you have here in the city. So if you want to access often the job market, if you want to access a doctor or a nurse, an education, social services, you want to see a physiotherapist, you have to leave your community and you have to come into the city. And that's why NAN has their head office in Thunder Bay as well. And you should also know that Thunder Bay is Robinson Superior Treaty Territory. That's my mother's family's treaty territory. But I knew Stan would be there in his office and he was. He was waiting for me. And when I got there to speak with him, you know, when you start off, um, you sit down with somebody and you're first doing your interview, you usually start off with a pretty soft question. You want to start to make the person you're about to interview feel comfortable. Um, I knew Stan, but I still wanted to make him feel comfortable. So I said to him, so Stan, um, tell me, why is it Indigenous people don't vote in elections? Big broad question. Can't get any broader than that. And he looked at me and he said, why aren't you doing a story on Jordan LaBoss? And then I thought, oh my gosh, he's not hearing what I'm saying. So I repeated my question. And then he looked at me and he said, Jordan has been missing for 70 days. And we went on like that for a good while, about 10, 15 minutes. I would ask a question about the election. I would say something like, so Stan, you know, if everyone in some of the communities in certain ridings all voted as a block, you could actually influence the election in that certain riding. And then he would look at me and he said, we found a cap down by the water. We were having two different conversations. And keep in mind, too, that I had to sort of stop for a second because I knew that I wasn't going to get anywhere. I wasn't going to get the story that I had pitched to my editors that I had come to Thunder Bay for. I had to put my manic Toronto journalist self aside. And I had to remember who I was, where I was, and how I was sitting with the Grand Chief and he was trying to tell me something and I wasn't listening to what he was saying. It's at that period that I like to think that I opened my ears to what he was saying. And he said to me at that point that Jordan was the seventh student to go missing or to die in Thunder Bay since 2000. Number seven. When he said that to me, a lot of things went through my mind. You know, first I was embarrassed and I was ashamed. I was ashamed that I didn't know more about this. I was ashamed as an Anishinaabe woman that I didn't know this story and that I wasn't writing about this story. I was ashamed as a journalist. I wanted to know where all the other, where were the national newspapers? Where were the satellite trucks? Where was everybody else? How come they weren't doing stories on these kids? No one was seeing this whatsoever. It was then that Stan said to me, let me take you on a drive. So we got into his truck and we drove down to the Kaministiqua River. And we drove and we were going for a while and when we ended up at the cam, I remember getting out of the truck and again that feeling of unease came over me and that feeling of sickness came over me because I knew exactly where we were. When I looked up, I could see Anna Mikiwaju. I could see Mount McKay, the spiritual center of Fort William First Nation, my grandmother's reserve, where I had been with my family, where I'd been for powwows with my children, and we're standing at the base of it by the water. And I said to Stan, what are we doing here? And he said that this is where First Nations trackers believe that Jordan was last seen, his baseball cap, was found on the ice by the water. He said that they found footprints as well. And within, within about two and a half months of us standing there, Jordan's body would be found right there in the water as the ice broke up. Then he said to me again, Let's get back in the car and go on another drive. And so we did. 
and he took me to Dennis Franklin Carmarty High School. Dennis Franklin Carmarty High School is an indigenous run high school that um, opened in Thunder Bay in 2000. And uh, it is really a special, amazing, incredible place. Six of the seven fallen feathers went to Dennis Franklin Cromarty High School. So Stan brought me in to the high school. Um, I'll never forget this. He dropped me off at the principal's office and he said to everyone there, he said, um, this is Tanya, she's Nish, tell her everything. And so I began to learn about the students. I spoke to their teachers. And then I had to make that phone call. I had to make my phone call to my editor to say, yeah, you know that story that you sent me up here to write on the election? Well, I still haven't handed that story in. To the star's credit, they said, chase that story, get that story, and let's, let's do it. And so we did. We put it on the front page. Um, I had uh, Greg, one of the teachers of the kids, holding up some pictures of them. And um, I began to follow that story. I began to follow that story as a journalist. Remember I told you I was a provincial reporter? So I was at Queen's Park. And I could be there when the politicians came out of their sitting during the day. And I could ask some questions. I could ask some things like, hey, do you guys, do you know what's happening in Thunder Bay? Have you, have you heard? Why are there no schools for the children? Why do they have to come to Thunder Bay? How come you haven't called an inquest into the deaths of the kids in Thunder Bay? And I began to write stories for my editors. You could probably imagine too, I wrote stories and my editors would also say, why are you writing so many stories on this? It became something, um, something I couldn't let go. You know, sometimes stories find you. And I think very much this time that this story found me. I knew in so many ways too that I could not tell the story I wanted to tell in newspaper articles. I knew that this story was so, so much more than what, what I could say in printed word. I knew I needed to tell people the background of why it is these kids died here in this city. And that background, I have to say to you, while Thunder Bay is where the story is set and does have so many issues, I think they took over as a hate crime capital of, uh, actually, of Canada. Um, and I knew that the best place for me would be to be more expansive in a nonfiction book. And I got to say, I think that's the beauty of nonfiction. As we as journalists too, we can go deeper. We can probe stories in a totally different way than we do in newspaper articles. We can bring readers in and show them who we are writing about. And we can tell them stories and provide the context that we often can't get or grasp in a smaller story. Even in the age of the web, I would argue. Yes, I just said the web. Um, even in the age of digital journalism. There's still something, yes, I'm going to defend books. There's still something precious about the written word and being able to tell our stories and put them right here. And I needed to tell a story that involves so much more. I needed to tell the story through First Nations eyes of what broken treaties meant, through our eyes of what it means to leave a community or to grow up at the side of the road and have to go in to go to school, of being poor, of living with poverty or living with lack of water, safe housing, what this all means and how we came to this, how we came to this due to many things in this country, like those broken treaties I was talking about and like something called the Indian residential school system. I'm going to get to that in a minute, but first I should pause and sort of show you or introduce you to the kids. Um, these are the seven fallen feathers. I'm going to talk a little bit about them now, but I'll tell you more about them as I go on and about the relationships um, that I built with the, the families too. There's uh, Jethro Anderson. Um, he was, uh, he's wearing the white baseball cap there in the uh, top left. He's from Casabonica Lake First Nation. He had just turned 15 years old. And that um, 
He was the first uh, boy to go missing and to be found in the water in 2000. Beside him is Kern Strang, um, 18. He's got the yellow hoodie on. He's from uh, Pekanjikum First Nation. Beside uh, Kern is Paul, Paul Panachis. Paul was 21. He was the oldest of the seven, the seven kids. He had um, he'd gone to 10 different boarding homes just trying to get his high school education. Beside Paul is Robin, Robin Harper. She is from Kiwewin First Nation. She was from Kiwewin First Nation. It's a really small place, about 600 kilometers northwest of Thunder Bay. She'd only been in uh, Thunder Bay for three days before she passed away. On the bottom left, wearing the socks cap, the black socks cap, is um, Reggie, Reggie Bushy, who was uh, 15 years old, also in grade nine. He was, um, was from Poplar Hill First Nation. And beside, Beside him is uh, Kyle, Kyle Morriso. Kyle was also from Kiwewin. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him as I go on as well. Um, Kyle comes from a very famous artistic family. And beside Kyle is Jordan. And Jordan is, um, he was from Webakoy, grade 9, 15 years old. So it took me um, a number of years to sort of get myself together and realize that this, uh, this needed to be a book and I had the time and the space and ability to do a book. Um, you know, it's difficult when you're a, a writer um, you, and you have a full-time job and you actually need that full-time job to be a writer in this country as well. Um, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword. Um, and I remember... I remember uh, when I was ready to write this book, I reached out to the new Grand Chief of Anishinaabe Aski Nation, Alvin Fiddler. And I'll, I'll never forget the conversation I had with him. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to tell him, first off, he was the very first person I turned to because I wanted to tell him that I was going to do a book on the seven and their families and the students. And I wanted to know what he thought. And so I met him at a Toronto, um, Toronto cafe. He was having a romantic weekend with his wife, Tisa. No romantic weekend is complete without me showing up and you know, uh, saying, do you have a few minutes? Yeah, he's a journalist, right? You know, would you mind half an hour, please, so we can sit down and like talk about this? And he was, of course, accommodating. Um, he's an incredible guy. If you um, if you don't know Alvin, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He is a powerhouse, and he crams more into four days than most people cram into four months. Um, Tisa and Alvin were down doing a. Uh, they were there to see Prince. It was Prince's last time in Toronto. They were going to a fetal alcohol syndrome conference. Um, he was signing an MOU with the province of Ontario. And, um, oh, he had to go to cop's record shop to go find some vinyl. So he had all this stuff to do, but he sat down with me and he gave me this sort of what's this all about look on his face. And I told him, I told him that I felt like it was time for me to write a book about the seven students. And I apologized. I apologized because I felt bad that I didn't do this earlier and I didn't do this before. And he looked at me and he said, you don't have to apologize for not doing the book then. He goes, you weren't meant to write it then. You're meant to write this now. And then he gave me a piece of advice. And at this point, you know, when your grand chief tells you something, I learned to listen. And he said to me, you need to start your book with Chani Wenjak. And I remember saying to myself, Johnny Wenjack, Johnny Wenjack, who's Johnny Wenjack? I didn't know the song by Willie Dunn on Johnny. I hadn't read Ian Adams' incredible, incredible magazine piece in Maclean's that was published in 1967 about the life and death of Johnny Wenjack. Such an important piece of journalism. And I, you know, I would recommend it to any students or even teachers in the room to go and read it again. Um, it's incredible that he did that in 1967. 
So I took his advice. I packed up my mom and my kids and I took off for Kenora, Ontario. I went because Chani's story is integral to the lives of the seven fallen feathers. And it's integral now to what's happening in our communities because his story is a story about residential schools. And as we all know, if you are an Indigenous person in this country, your life somehow has been touched by the residential school experience. You know, we call this intergenerational trauma, but this is actually a very, very real thing. It's not just a catchphrase. We all have lived it in some way, shape, or form. Brief recap. 150,000 Inuit, Métis, First Nations kids were taken from their families, from their homes, from their culture, from their communities, from everything that they know, and they were sent away to church-run, government-funded schools. There were 139 of these schools located across the country. And this is one of my favorite Sir John A. Macdonald quotes. Had the real interesting experience of uh, roses laughing down there, of um, being at the Rideau Club a little while ago, and I spoke and I spoke about residential school and I spoke about uh, seven uh, the seven fallen feathers and I spoke right under a massive portrait of Sir John A. Macdonald. It was really yeah it was really interesting. Um, I wonder what he thought. Anyway, this is uh, and I actually read this quote. This is, um, this is the thought at the time. When the school is on the reserve, the child lives with the parents who are savages. He is surrounded by savages, and though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training and mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. It has been strongly pressed on myself as head of the department that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes of thought of white men. As a journalist, it's so important that we always provide context to residential schools and to intergenerational trauma. And I do try and do that in the newsroom, you know, when we are um, talking about stories um, because there are, let's see, sometimes I'm the only Indigenous person in the newsroom. I'll be lucky if I have one other reporter that's there. Um, so I often spend a lot of my time talking about this and uh, the importance of providing context about this because you see, this isn't something abstract. This is, this is something you feel and you feel it generations and generations down the line. And it's important that we sort of translate that into our stories too. And you understand that and you feel it as well. Because I do believe that stories of people really help change and shape opinion and they help change and shape policy. Back to my circle. So remember I told you I packed my mom and my kids in my minivan and we drove from Thunder Bay to Kenora. And we did that um, because I wanted to find out more about Chani Wenjack, like Alvin had told me. And you know, it was an interesting ride with my mom too in the car because we went to Wraith and we, um, we talked about some things and we unearthed, you know, memories. A lot of things that my mom doesn't like to talk about. My mom was raised by residential school survivors and it was, it was not an easy upbringing, you know. But I think, again, as journalists, since we all, as Indigenous journalists, if you've had that experience, you are better almost shaped to tell the story and to bring it forward as well in a more compassionate way. So we, um, we got to Cecilia Jeffrey Indian Residential School and I knew that there was not going to be nothing there. But again, as a journalist, sometimes you need to go. You need to go and you need to feel it, right? You need to feel the place. You need to see little tiny things like the sidewalks that, that all the sidewalks that look like they've been walked on by legions of Roman soldiers and lead to nowhere. Um, there's all there was left uh, was a little mobile home um, that is the Grand Council Treaty Number no. Three office. It's a little blue mobile home, and it was stuck on what was left of the foundation at the time. And I was there so I could speak to Elder Thomas White. Elders are 
so important in our communities. They are the knowledge keepers. They are the memory and the language, and they are the teachers. And I was there to see Thomas because I was told if I want to find out about Chani, go talk to him. And I have to say too that I'm very much remembering um, Tommy White tonight because we lost him about a month ago, and he was an incredible um, he was an incredible help with learning about residential schools um, in Kenora and putting this book together. So I met him. He said to me, come into the office. I was, of course, caring. As journalists, you also know you come with gifts, Tim Hortons donuts, a box. Um, and you also come with, like, you know, triple, triple coffees. And so I came with all of my things, and um, I met him there. And he's, like, he was, a, he was a small, like, really spry guy. And he was, like, full of energy. And he's, like, okay, let's go. So we went up to his office, um, and we sat down. And then he said, well, you know, um, I don't really have very much left of the school. But he showed me where, you know, he sort of showed me around. He said, okay, well, the, the swing set's over there. The graves of the students who didn't leave home or didn't leave here are there. He showed me where the baseball diamond was, and he said, don't go there. Um, and then he said, if you want to find out about Chani Wenjack, you need to look in this black box. And so he dove under his desk, and he pulled out this big black suitcase. And in the suitcase, there were so many photographs. There were photographs like the picture that you see here um, of all of these children. And what I couldn't believe was hardly any of the pictures were labeled. I would say about 5% of them were. So I was looking at the faces of all of these kids, and I didn't know who they were. And I kept thinking to myself, you know, I'm a mom. I would want to know how my child is doing. Did parents get to see any of these pictures? Did they know how anyone was doing? I'm going to say probably not. They were left wondering. And why I really liked this picture was because it shows what the kids were wearing, a sort of standard issue at the time at Cecilia Jeffrey. They had plaid shirts, um, flannel shirts, jeans, and leather, little leather boots. Um, and I look at this picture and I wonder too about Shawnee. Um, if you don't know about him, you probably all do, but I'm going to tell you just a little bit about him. He was 12 years old from uh, Agoki Post, a community inside Martin Falls First Nation on the shore of the Albany River. And he was 12 years old. And that Sunday, that late Sunday in October, he and um, nine other kids decided they were, going to, um, they were going to leave that day. And I often, too, think to myself, I wonder what was going through his mind that he and all of those kids decided that that's the day they had to go. And he was, he was a really smart kid. You know, he, in his 12-year-old mind, thought to himself, you know what, I came in by rail, so I'm going to leave by rail. I'm going to start to walk. I'm going to walk home. But sadly, if you know anything about the weather in the Thunder Bay area in late October, what can look like a bright, sunny, beautiful day can turn just, uh, just as soon as the sun goes down, and it becomes so, so cold at night. And, of course, you see the picture and what he was wearing, um, and he had a windbreaker jacket on as well. He got as far as Reddit, Ontario. Home was 900 kilometers away. He got to Reddit, Ontario, and he, um, he collapsed, and he died of exposure on the side of, uh, on the, side of the um, railway tracks. So there was an inquest held into Chani's death. And this is part of the reason why Alvin Fiddler told me I need to look at this story of Chani, because it's all interwoven. See how hard it would be to get all this into a newspaper article? He was absolutely right, you know. There was an inquest held into Chani's death, 1967. The family didn't know about the inquest. Um, they didn't have legal standing. And the jury asked a really, really interesting question. The jury said, this is one of their recommendations, they said, why are we still doing this? Why is it in the late 1960s we're taking children away from their families and their homes and their language and their communities and from everything they know and putting them into residential schools? Why are we doing this? It's 2019 in this country. We are still taking children away 
children are forced to move away from their families, their homes, their languages, their communities, everything that they know, and move into cities. Cities like Thunder Bay, like Sioux Lookout, like Timmins, like Ottawa, and go to high school because there are no high schools for them in their home communities. Think about that. It's something, of course, I think about all the time. Um, and it's something that I really, as a journalist, it really took me a long time to wrap my head around all of these fundamental inequalities, you know, that I was learning about as I went on on these stories. And it's amazing, too, because, you know, a lot of people say to me, so are you still a journalist? Are you an activist? What are you? You know, because you talk about all of these things. You can ask me about this later on, and I'll probably give you, I don't know, a willy-nilly answer. But um, I will tell you this. These stories are true. And how, once you are gifted with these stories, how do you turn away? How do you not tell these stories? How do you not tell them to everyone and get them to understand? You know, Senator Marie Sinclair calls it arming the reasonable. I think that's what, sometimes that's what we do. That brings me back to the kids, um, the Seven Fallen Feathers. I told you I'd tell you a little bit more about them. And I have to tell you too, um, and this, this is something, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the process of putting the book together, which is something totally different than what you do as a journalist writing newspaper stories. Um, the first boy, Jethro Anderson, I learned a lot about Jethro through his aunt, Dora Morris. His aunt, Dora, um, loved him like a son. And um, she was the one that cared for him. And she told me very much his story, the story of Jethro. She opened her home to me. I met her so many times at Tim Hortons, I can't begin to tell you. It was our, my satellite office in Thunder Bay. Um, and honestly, without the stories of the families, helping me along, this book would not be anywhere what it is today at all. Jethro was 15 and he was out one Saturday night. He had just turned 15 years old. He was out with his uh, cousin Nathan, her son. And when she got home that night around 10 o'clock, Nathan was there, but there was no Jethro. And that's when um, she said to her husband, Tom, let's get into our van and start driving around the streets of Thunder Bay to look for him. And so she did, they did. They drove, and they drove for about five hours looking for him, and they couldn't find him. So she, when she got back into home, she, of course, reached for the phone, and she called the police to say, Jethro hasn't come home. And the person who answered the, um, the phone at the station said to her, oh, don't worry about it. He's probably just out there partying like all the other Native kids. And then he hung the phone up. It took the Thunder Bay police six days to start searching for a missing grade nine student. And during that time, Stella McKay, his mom, came down from Casabonica. First Nations searchers, including Alvin and Tisa Fiddler, were out searching for Jethro. Sadly, um, his body would be found in the Kaministiqua River. Kern Strang, he was um, 18, and he was from uh, Pekanjikum. And I just I wanted to tell you a little bit about him, too, because it's so important that, you know, we look deeper into the stories of, of the people that we're writing about, and we reach out to families and friends, people that know them, and find out a little bit more about them, you know? Like, Curran was known for singing gospel songs and having this incredible smile and just sort of being a person that people were drawn to. And Curran's family... Um, they were really quiet and they did not want to participate in the eventual inquest that was held into the Seven's deaths. But I was lucky to speak to friends that knew Curran, that knew him at DFC, at the high school that he went to, told me a little bit about his story. And during the time that Curran went missing, his community of Pekanjikum was, um, was having a lot of, uh, a lot of hard times. The elementary school in the, um, in the community had burned down. And also, there, um, there was a suicide issue at the time in the community. Um, in fact, Pekanjikum at that time had the, one of the highest youth suicide rates in the Western world. 
And I'm telling you that not because I'm making any suggestion whatsoever that Curran took his life. Quite the opposite, actually. But these are the things that kids come down to school with. You know, you don't leave your problems at the door in your community. You, they come with you, you know, and they're on your mind. And the kids require a lot more help, you know. They need counseling, they need support, they need some services to sort of, to sort of get through. Um, these are the things that you need to know about the kids, too, when you're writing about them. It's important to say and to make them seen as people. Very much so. Sometimes in news articles or in, um, on TV clips, it's harder to get those stories. Paul Panachis, um, I told you about Paul. He was 21 and he, um, he actually passed away on his mom's kitchen floor because she had, um, she said, you know what, it's enough. You've been to 10 different boarding homes. I'm gonna move to Thunder Bay and I'm going to rent a house and you're going to come live with me and we're going to get your high school education. And that's what she did. And I have to tell you again about Marianne. You know, um, again, I got to know the families and um, she is a woman that I have to tell you is, is full of strength and she's amazing. She is a residential school survivor and um, her, her sister is one of the murdered and missing indigenous women and girls in this country, Sarah Skunk. She has been missing since the late 1990s. Marianne is a lovely, amazing woman, and she told me so much about Paul. I went to her home in Mish. She showed me this picture about her son. They were really, really close. Um, the cause of his, uh, his death is undetermined. Um, and why I'm also telling you about her story is because when he collapsed and 911 came, first responders, um, and took him away to the hospital. Nobody phoned Marianne. No doctor, no coroner, no health official, no one. No one called her to tell her how it was her son died. She would have to wait nine years till the start of an inquest to find out what had happened to her boy. And if you know the story of Marianne, this is where we go deeper with our storytelling. You get to know someone and what they've been through in their life and know that she has a sister that she still doesn't, doesn't know where she is. I called the chapter on, um, on Paul and Marianne the hollowness of not knowing. Because at the inquest they told her they had no idea why it was her son died. You only keep materials from a coroner for seven years and then it's destroyed. All you have is the, um, is the work that's been done before, and that's what you use to check to see what you're doing an inquest, if it's been a long time, to see what it could possibly have been that took his life. Do you remember I told you about Robin Harper? Um, again, you know, there's a, here, there's a theme here, strong indigenous women. Um, Robin's mom, Tina, is amazing. Uh, again, a lovely, lovely woman. Um, again, someone who opened up stories to me about her, about her daughter, someone she loved very, very much. Um, and Robin had only been in Thunder Bay for three days. She didn't know anyone and, um, you know, when you come into a community too, you want to make friends and sometimes kids go out and they drink. Surprise, teenagers drink. Um, and that's what she did, you know. Um, she went out and she was trying to make some friends. But the only thing was is that she wasn't used to drinking a lot. And so she, when she drank, she drank um, that evening to excess. And sadly, um, that is how she died. Reggie Bushy, um, again, strong, amazing mother. Mother is Rhoda King. Uh, Reggie was 15 years old and his body was found in the McIntyre River on November 1st, 2007. He was in grade 9. And by this point, Indigenous leaders in the North were pushing for an inquest into the deaths of the kids. Alvin Fiddler was working as, um, he was in charge of health for Nan at the time, and he was pushing to get an inquest to get the Ontario government to start caring as to what was going on in Thunder Bay and what was happening with these kids. And, you know, they weren't getting very far. The Ontario government said, okay, we'll hold an inquest, but we'll only hold an inquest into one child's death. 
Reggie Bushy. So that wasn't good enough for Rhoda, Reggie's mom. She wanted to know why it was all the other kids weren't included in the inquest. And she had a really good question too. She wanted to know who was going to sit on the inquest jury. She wanted to know if any First Nations people would be sitting on that jury. And that was a really important question. That question and the fact that at that point too, Alvin had met a lawyer by the name of Julian Falkner, who you're probably all familiar with. He's, a, he's an incredibly noted human rights lawyer. And Alvin had seen Julian tear apart Mike Harris on the stand at the Ipperwash Inquiry. And he had gone up to Julian and he said, Julian, you don't know me, but my name's Alvin Fiddler and I need your help. And a friendship started there. And Julian, to his credit, he, he went into Thunder Bay and boy, did he help change things there. They started to legally ask the province, why is it there's only an inquest into one of the kids' deaths and who's sitting on the inquest jury? And those questions would have reverberations in communities all across this country. Justice Frank Yakabuchi was appointed by the Ontario government to look into the jury roll system in Northern Ontario. And one of the things that he would eventually find is that, of course, entire communities were left off the jury roll system, entire communities which is, again, something that's really quite remarkable when you look at the over-representation of Indigenous people in prisons across this country, yet when you look at how many First Nations, Indigenous lawyers there are, or clerks, or security guards, or judges, it's very different. So they fought to get an inquest, and while they were fighting, Sadly, two more kids would pass away. Kyle Morisot, um, 17. And I, um, I got to know Christian Morisot, um, who told me about his son, and who let me into his life and told me about what he was dealing with, um, with the loss of his boy. And this is, this is Kyle, and I, I love this picture of him. Um, and I love the story, too, that Christian tells about him. And that story is, is that um, actually was here in Ottawa. He was having a showing, Christian, because Christian's an artist. He was having a showing of his work. And he said, um, you know what, I'm going to show my work, but uh, I want you to also have my son's work in the audience. Or, sorry, in the gallery. And so his son's work was there. And that night, Kyle's work sold more than Christians. He was so proud of that story and he told it to me and I always think about that. And that's Christian. I went to visit him. As you know, um, it's important to try and get to know people, um, families especially as they're, as they're talking to you and telling you these stories. And here's um, something I'm going to tell you. Uh, it was a piece of advice given to me um, by Duncan McHugh. He said, and he uses this phrase, if you've heard him speak before on journalism, he always says, don't be a story taker. Don't do that. Don't just go smashing into a community or to a family and take that story, run away, and just never talk to them again. You can't do that. You know? And that's not just for dealing with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis families. I would say it's probably good human practice for anybody. You know, yet we as news organizations, that's what we often do, right? The news cycle, you sort of go smashing into a place and you, you know, you want to get, um, you want to get information from someone as soon as you possibly can. And you want to go back to your editor and say, this is what I have. That's not, that's not a, a good thing, is it? You know, it's damaging for, for everyone. Um, if you take the time to actually get to know a family and a community, that comes back to you in many different ways. Um, and Christian really um, gave back. He, um, he painted this incredible, incredible painting that's absolutely huge. And it's, uh, it's a requiem to his firstborn son. On the top right is, um, is uh, Kyle. This is their journey to the afterlife. And he said, you could use this picture for the cover of your book. 
And then he said, you know, um, the title of his painting was Seven Fallen Feathers. He said to me, I'm sick and tired of listening to the journalists and to the, um, the lawyers, the police, and everybody calling the kids the seven dead students. He said, you know what, that's really, it's so, um, it's so demeaning. These kids, they all have families that love them. They come from communities that love them. They all had possibility, they all had lives. They were so much more than they're being painted out to be. They were seven fallen feathers. And he is right. I often say many hands helped me write this book and I really do think that this is true. We did something when we wrote this book that we don't normally do. As journalists, you never do this. Um, this manuscript, this book was read by the families. So all the families, except for Kerr and Strang's family, who, um, who really, they didn't participate in the inquest and they were kind of living off the grid at the time. But all of the other families we reached out to and they read the chapter on their child before it went to print. My elder, uh, I call him my elder because I spent so much time with him, Sam Ashley Panetskum, he also read this book before we went to print. Alvin Fiddler read this book before we went to print. Tisa, his wife, who's a teacher, she read this book before we went to print. That's something you don't do in a newsroom when you're writing stories. You know, you don't check your story. But this was different. This was different to them and it was different to me. These are people that I know. These are people that I love. This is a community. And this was all of us telling this story. This was many hands coming together to tell this story. And I'm very grateful to them for helping me, especially Jordan's mom. Um, again, it's almost all the strong women that I'm talking about here tonight. Jordan, um, there he is in the silver shirt with his um, baseball cap on backwards. He was a champion goalie and he had, um, he had begged his mom to go to Thunder Bay to go to high school because he wanted to play hockey. He wanted to play hockey with all the other kids. He wanted to play on a real team with, um, with, the, you know, in, with great equipment and um, he wanted you know, to be in the NHL one day. And so I remember it took me so long to finally get her to respond to my emails and my phone calls. She was working up at uh, Webaquay First Nation where she lives. And I remember I finally got her and honestly the book was about to go to print, like just days. And I said to her, will you please read this and just let me know what do you think. She gets back to me and all she said was, you've made three errors. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay, what is it? And so she told me, this is wrong, this is wrong, and this is wrong. And so I corrected it. And then she said, thank you. So we thought the book was done. We thought that my publisher has the book and it's all finished, you know, um, it's been uh, a journey for all of us. And then sadly, we weren't finished. I had to write an epilogue. Um, and that was something that we didn't see coming. But on May 6th in 2017, uh, two more children from the north uh, disappeared on the very same night and um, their bodies would be found in the water, um, the McIntyre River as well, within two weeks of each other. So the story continues, you know, the story very much continues. Um, so many, so many people are part of this story. So many news organizations do incredible work on this story. Um, APTN does incredible work on this story. They're there every single day. Willow Fiddler, total shout out to the work that she does. Um, Jody Porter at CBC, she sat in the inquest every single day and she reported on it. She does incredible, incredible work. So many people have watched this story and have been a part of it. And I'm grateful to all of them because, um, again, many hands. We all came together to write this book and to tell the story. And at the, uh, there was an inquest into the deaths of the seven kids. It took a long time to, to come, but it finally did come. It was the second largest inquest ever held in Ontario's history. 145 recommendations after eight months of 200 witnesses. 
Um, and if you, uh, if you notice in the news a little bit, um, I think it was just last week, there was a report card that was put out by the families. Um, this is part of the inquest recommendations that every year they check to see how we're doing with the recommendations. And um, I think it's around 65, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's 65 have been done or on their way to being done in the recommendations. But in order to, to get these recommendations all done, it's gonna take many partners. It's gonna take the federal government. It's gonna take the province. It's going to take the municipal government. And it's gonna take the communities, the First Nations communities and the communities of Thunder Bay to come together and to make things a little bit better. Because fundamental changes need to happen in this country in order to actually make things so much better. But before I get to that, because I will, <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you that at the end of the inquest, the um, Ontario government, um, they sent some investigators in to look at the Thunder Bay police because for years, for decades, Indigenous people have been saying there are issues with the police in Thunder Bay. And so they sent investigators up. Jerry McNeely, who's part of the OIPRD, looked into issues of systemic racism in Thunder Bay. And um, guess what? they found there is systemic racism in the Thunder Bay Police Force. Surprise. Um, and uh, I have to tell you that when this report came out in December, a lot, a lot of the people I know, there wasn't feeling of joy. There wasn't feeling of <coughs> elation or happiness or anything like that. There was more of a feeling of being numb again and being hollow. I remember calling Dora Morris, Jethro's aunt, and I said, what do you think? You know what she said to me? 18 years is a long time. And she's right. As part of the OIP investigation, nine cases were ordered to be reopened by a multidisciplinary police force. And of those nine cases, four are of the seven fallen feathers. Jethro Anderson's case has been asked to be reopened, Curran Strang's case, Kyle Morisot, and Jordan LaBosse. The um, Thunder Bay Police was also investigated by um, Senator Marie Sinclair. And if that doesn't sort of tell you the um, scope of the issue that was in Thunder Bay, I don't know what else would, as you know, Senator Sinclair was the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in this country. And he looked into the failings of the Thunder Bay Police Board. And what he recommended right off the bat was get rid of the board. Let's put an administrator in there. And two First Nations women from Fort William First Nation now sit on that police board. For the longest time, there were no Indigenous representation on the Thunder Bay Police Force. One woman was appointed onto the board. She's from Fort William. And she was put in as an advisory role. She wasn't actually made a voting member of the board. Well, that's all changed. So I get to, um, you know, I could speak for two hours, but I'm sure you don't want to hear that <laughs> because um, what I discovered with this book, the journey I was on with this book, led me to my second book, led me to all our relations. I didn't realize that when I was writing this book, I was going to be delving into so much about the issues of education, the inequalities that we face with education to this very day, and all the things we need to do to change those inequalities. Because it doesn't just start with education, it starts also with communities and our communities and the social inequities that we face in our communities. You know, safe housing. What does it take to grow healthy children? We all know what it takes to grow healthy children. This is not rocket science. This is 2019. We know that things like clean water, running sewers, safe housing that's not moldy, Having parents or someone who loves you, that tucks you in at night and tells you that you matter, you're going to be somebody one day and that we love you. Nutrition, access to a doctor or to a nurse. All of those communities, there's not one doctor living in any of those NAN communities. If you want to access healthcare, 
you have to go to Thunder Bay, you have to go to a city. You're lucky if you live in a community that has nursing care and nurses that are properly trained for things like advanced life support, mental health care, cardiac arrests. You're lucky if you get all of those things. Again, de the determinants of health are completely missing in many of our communities. How can this be in this day and age? So that led me to book number two. That led me to asking those questions again. And that led me to being here today, not really enjoying speaking to groups of people, but again, there is that when the stories come to you, you have a responsibility to tell them and hopefully arm the reasonable, as Senator Sinclair says. And so with that, I would like to say Gitche Miigwech for listening to me today. And I think that Francine has to come back up here and sit with me now. Thank <laughs> you.